Hi, I'm John Champion. Today we're going to talk about patera. This Prince of Wales oval inlay patera. That's at the top of the legs in this table I made for my hallway. I made this table specifically for this space. I wanted something long, something shallow. I gave it some character with a bow front and I wanted to decorate the legs. This is African mahogany and the finish on it is Wardalox clear finish followed by shellac. The interesting thing about Wardalox is it darkens the mahogany, which is what I wanted, but it does not darken the holly. It gives it an aged tone, which I wanted, but I wanted to keep the brightness of the holly. So I really liked the finish that gave to me. I did not know how to make this patera when I started this project. I had taken a workshop with our local SAFM chapter, the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, to learn the fundamentals of how to make the tapered leg, the inlays for the bell flowers, the stringing, putting on a cup, and setting some banding. But I did not know how to make this Prince of Wales pattern because it didn't exist. I had to design that. I did a lot of practicing, and after four or five efforts at that, I wasn't sure I was ever going to be able to make one. But I had a vision for what I wanted to accomplish, and I just kept at it. And I think that's a lesson for me and for all of you. I will often take on projects that I don't know how to do yet. And I teach myself the skill because I can use that later in other projects. You could do the same thing. The level of detail I went to to make this Prince of Wales patera is more than many people will want to deal with. I made some very small parts, sand shaded some very small parts, and, and corrected some mistakes that really don't have to be corrected. But I wanted to be able to look at this up close and say this is something I like looking at because I'm making this for me. Most people only see this from four or five feet away as they're walking by at the table. Let's go to the shop and I'll show you how I make it. The most time consuming part of this project is making the legs. I knew if I could make the leg, I could make the table. And within the leg, the patera has its own challenges. I had to make a Prince of Wales pattern that was only two inches tall and only an inch and a quarter across. It's very small. So I went out of the internet looking for some examples. I was going to copy one and, and use for this, and I couldn't find any. What I found were a lot of patterns that were larger, a lot of patterns that were wider than they were tall, but nothing that had this vertical orientation. So in the end, I designed my own. So I figured out the oval had to be this size, two by one and a quarter. And the first thing I did was work out the shape of the oval. I didn't want it too pointed on the top or bottom. I want a nice graceful arc around both ends. And once I said that, set that right, I digitized it and started freehand drawing on some patterns. And I had a hard time drawing inside the line, drawing this small, this much detail. But I kept at it and after 11 designs, I finally got to something I thought I could use and thought I could repeat. Here's some examples of my progress along the way. So when I finally got a pattern here on the far left that was taller than it was wide, I went to try to cut it on my scroll saw. And that was my original intent to cut this on my power scroll saw. But I discovered very quickly my scroll saw is a vintage machine and my skills are less than professional on a scroll saw. And the pieces just exploded in front of me. So after two or three of those explosions, I determined I was going to have to do something different. So I decided to use a hand saw. So I used this new concept saw with a 2-0 blade in it. And along the way, I'd, I'd changed the pattern. I got little deeper gullets inside the feathers here to end up with what's on the end. And along the way, I made a few decisions. I first of all decided I was going to have to cut this by hand. I then concluded I was not going to be able to cut these really fine parts like the quill stems with any consistency. And the crosses I kept tearing up when I was trying to cut those with a handsaw also. So in the end, I decided I would also inlay the stems, I would cut separately and inlay the crosses. I'd cut them with an exacto blade. And the last thing I learned was the feather lines. I originally planned to cut the feather lines with my handsaw, but you couldn't make very many without destroying the piece. So I ended up taking an exacto blade to scratch in feather lines, smeared the whole surface with hide glue, which darkened the lines themselves, and then 
scraped it off and finished it, and it gave me a, a darker tone in the lines to indicate the feathers. Let's make one. So the pieces we're going to use for this are a backer piece and a top piece, a stiffener, to keep these pieces of veneer together, a piece of holly veneer, which is going to make the pattern, and a background piece of dyed poplar. So on the front of it, I have glued a copy of my pattern, pattern number 11, you can see. And I put that together just with staples. This actually, I think, is basswood, my cover, so it's pretty soft. You can also use a pin nailer if you have it, but, and you can use small nails. The stapler works just fine for me. And I'm stapling outside the line that I'm going to eventually cut for the oval. And it's just keeping all the parts together while I handle it. And I'll just knock the backs of those staples over a little bit. Then I've got to drill a hole to insert my blade to start. And what I'm going to do, since I'm going to inlay this cross anyway, I'm going to drill a hole right in the bottom of the cross, but above my first cut line that's going to go around this crown. I'm going to cut out the outside edge of the crown, and later we'll come back and trim off the two pieces of the crown, top and bottom, with an X-Acto blade. So I'm going to put a hole right there. And just a small blade. You can use any size blade as long as it's not bigger than the cross you want to inlay. and then thread your blade through the hole. Now I will tell you a little trick here is at the bottom of this blade I took a grinding wheel in a Dremel machine and ground off the teeth and part of the shank on the bottom inch of the blade. And what that allowed me to do was it created a smaller piece of metal to turn corners. So when I get to a corner here, you'll see I'm able to make a very sharp 90 degree turn because I'll move the blade up into that area where the ground off teeth will be and it makes an easy turn. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut off the crown, the whole outside edge of the crown. Just need to keep my blade straight up and down and just make, so I go to the bottom of the hole I just cut and start across the crown. all the way to the outer edge. And here's my first corner. And I push up and turn the piece at the same time. So I'm turning in that little area where I've ground the teeth off. I'm realigned and now I've made a very clean 90 degree turn. And the advantage of using this handsaw is I can not only make very tight turns, but I can control the speed of the saw. And here I've got to turn a corner and I've only got to go about a millimeter to my next turn. So it only takes two or three pulls and I'm there. And when I'm going across the page, when I come up the other side, I'm going to try to hit the same place so that's uniform on the other side. Again, that's a level of detail that's more than you probably need because no one's going to look that closely. And on the quills, the, quill, the bottom of these quill stems are only a millimeter across. So I try to be really careful to get right at the line for those and also I'll get right at the bottom so that one looks pretty good I got pretty much right on the line by the way I'm using just a piece of wood with a slot cut out of it It'd be called a bird's beak uh, so it's pretty simple methodology for supporting the piece while I'm cutting. And then the rest of these I just repeat. And this one I don't go all the way up. I, I get up a little way, do a 180, and come back. And if you look at this closely, going up and then down, they'll look a little different, but you have to really look closely to tell the difference. And no one's going to do that. And even if I got off, I had a couple where I missed the bottom of the quill stem. It doesn't really matter. You just uh, maybe hit a piece of sandpaper on the bottom to square them up, and let the glue fill the space. And That's one of the advantages of high glue on this because the background is, is dark. The high glue will be dark. So all the gaps 
are easily filled and easily disappear. And once you've made five or ten of these, you can uh, go quick. I'm a little bit out of practice, but uh, you can actually get through one of these fast. So I got the three tips of the stems there pretty uniform. In this corner, I have to be really careful coming back up here. I don't want to overshoot it. And once I turn, I've only got about a millimeter and change to go. I'm going to try to hit the same place I hit on the other side. And I come back to the line that's going to be the top. I just kind of judge where that is. And as you come across here, I pull this to the side to keep the piece on the solid wood part, not over the hole, so I don't drop it on the floor. And we're through and then you just pop them out. So there's our first piece, and I usually will put a little mark on here to indicate the top versus the bottom. And I know from the look what the top and bottom are. I just put a little pencil mark on it. I now can cut the ribbons. And I'm just gonna cut the outside of the ribbon. I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that in a little while. The ribbons, I want them to be pretty uniform on both sides, so I try to stay pretty close to the line. The one on the right, I know from practice, is drawn a little bit different at the bottom, so I just make an adjustment when I come around the bottom of that. And these tips are really small. They look larger to my eyes than they turn out to be when I cut them, it seems. And come on the outside the ribbon. And we'll do the other side. Let me say something about the ribbons while we're here. And we'll talk about it again briefly when we do sand shading. If you see on the ribbon, I've made some shady marks, dark spots. When you cut this ribbon out, this is the piece I, I just cut out of the ribbon on one side. I just cut out the outside shape, but that doesn't look very much like a folded ribbon. But if you sand shade it, it does. And so what we're going to do later when we come to sand shading, I take a carving gouge and I'll cut this tip of this ribbon right there and I'll cut it at the bottom right there. Then I'll take this piece and sand shade the tip and I'll take this little piece, which is only about two millimeters square, and shade the tip of that. And that coupled with the glue line gives you that sense of a ribbon folded over. But right now I've just cut it into this shape. And here's what a ribbon really looks like when you fold it over. So again, I'm gonna cut on that line, cut on that line, shade it, and shade to get that effect. So let's cut the other ribbon. As I said before, this is one I know is not quite drawn correctly at the bottom, so I'll make an adjustment when I come back around. And particularly in these curves, it's really important to keep your blade vertical. It helps, to, makes it a lot easier to turn curves and corners accurately. And here's where I make an adjustment at the bottom because I know it's drawn incorrectly. So I'm going to slow down and just try to come a little short of that bottom and then turn out. And while I ended up having to use a handsaw because I could not control the power of a scroll saw, I find this to be a very easy tool to use. It gives you very comfortable control of all these small parts. And you can actually get pretty fast with it. I'm going to just cut out the rest of this pretty quickly. I'm going to go up, I'm going to cut up the pattern on the stems. And I have to cut up the pattern at the top where these feather inserts are. And I have to cut down the pattern on the outside because that's where these indentations occur. So you'll see me go up and then back out of the pattern and go up again. So I'm just going to do this quickly.
Okay, so we've cut all the pieces out, laid them out here, uh, and this is the book I've taken apart. A couple of things to go back to. The blade I used, my saw is a 2-0 blade that I ground off the tip of from it. The other thing is I only cut one pattern here, but you can actually stack up several layers of holly and poplar, holly and poplar, and you can cut out two, three, four, or five copies at the same time. But I've only got to make eight copies, and that there's less resistance cutting just the two ply in the middle, so that's why I only cut one copy here. Okay, we have all the, the pieces together, and now we need to do a little work regarding the crown and the ribbons. If you remember, on the crown, I cut off the top and the bottom and shade the middle of the crown. And I'll just show you how I do that. I'm not going to go through the process, but this crown is pretty small. I mean, you can see it compared to my finger. And what I do to cut off the top of that is I'll take actually a scalpel. And I just set a straight edge on the top, and I will score the top of this line repeatedly. And I always work from the side where the edge is. Work from the edge in, and I'll turn it around and work from this edge in that way. And run through that, score it 10, 20, 30 times until I finally get it to break off. If I tried to put a big chisel on it and punch it, it would just crack the entire piece of veneer. I learned that the hard way. And I'll turn and cut the bottom off the same way. I want a little bottom edge, so I'll turn that over. I'll score that from the side. I'll score this from the side. And I'll just keep doing that 10, 20 times until I can finally get that off. You have to be very careful because that's so fragile. The ribbons, I mentioned this before, but just to make the point again, I just take a gouge and I cut across the top here, cut across the, top, the bottom here, and I have three pieces for the ribbons. And I sand shade the middle one and sand shade, shade the tiny piece. One of the things I didn't mention before is the first thing you need to do is sweep your floor. If you'll notice in that cutting out that part, I dropped a few parts on the floor. Fortunately, they were not parts that were important. But I have dropped a few of these on the floor. I've lost the tip of one of these ribbons once before and had to actually made a replacement piece to go in there. So that's how I trim the ribbons and how I trim the crowns. Sand shading is really very straightforward. I basically put some sand. This is Ace Hardware sand. Nothing really fancy about it. On a hot plate turned up to the maximum setting. And it probably takes 20 minutes to really get hot. And I'll do a couple of parts here to show you how. But I basically just take my forceps. I create a little low place in the sand. And the, the tips of the feathers I stick in pretty deep. But these side pieces I put in close to the valley because I just want the edges shaded. And I'll let this sit there two, three minutes, the, and it will darken it. And the sand shading darkens it not just at the surface below, but below the surface, because when you take this out of the packet, you're going to need to scrape it flush. And you'll scrape some of that darkness off of it, but because you sand shaded and not just colored the surface, the shading will go down into the wood. Some people will swear by special sand. Some people will go get special beach sand that's really fine-grained. And I guess if I was going to do a lot of this, I might go get something different. But for my purposes, this works plenty well. And you can see there, that's darkened. And that's all you need to do. So you repeat that with all these pieces, and then you glue it up. I'll put this, I'll put a piece of tape on the back of this and set these in place. And it just helps me keep control of the pieces. Okay, so when you get all those pieces in place, if you'll notice, I'll, I just cut a kerf up, and the original pattern actually had the stem line with two lines. And I originally tried cutting up both sides of that and failed miserably. So I just cut a single kerf line up, but what I'm going to do is inlay some stems, quill stems for that. 
And the quill stems, I just cut off a piece of veneer. I take a straight edge and just trim off a piece longer than what I need, maybe a millimeter or two. It doesn't have to be exact. And what you end up with are pieces that look like this. And it doesn't matter how wide you cut it because when I lay it in here, I'm going to lay it on edge. So the thickness of the veneer is the thickness of the stem you see in here. Lay it in place and just cut off the end. So I could put one in, and it stands proud, but I just plane that down, sand that down. But you might be able to get one in, but you can't get three in. So I have to plane these off. And even the one I just did, I'll plane that edge to make it smoother. So I want these edges to be smooth so the stems fit smooth. And I'll do it a couple of ways. I'll take a scalpel and I will literally plane the edge of it like this. And I'll, I'll look for all the bumps that are not even and I literally run it like a hand plane. And then I'll hit that with a piece of sandpaper maybe. Or I can sometimes, if it's already pretty smooth, I'll just take the sandpaper and rub along the edge there and create enough space. I mean you can see now that one's already straighter than it was before and you can see it, it easily would take a stem in there if I could put it in. But you get the idea. And you can repeat that three times and put all those stems in place. And when you've done all that, you end up with this. So here's one where I've set all the stems in place. The crown has been cut top and bottom. You can see the real thin lines there. And the ribbons have been cut top and bottom. Another thing about the ribbons, as I said before, when you glue this, the glue will highlight that line and give you more of that accent in addition to the sand shading you're gonna do. So this has tape on the back, if you remember. And I've got to glue this to a substrate piece. But in order to, do, I need to take the tape off to glue it to a substrate. So what I'm going to do is get a wet rag. And I'll just use some hot water out of my glue pot over there. And this is just basic veneer tape. So you wet the back, put it on, and it takes three pieces to cover this. And that's all it takes to use veneer tape. And I'll usually put some wax paper on that, put a piece of wood over and clamp it to my workbench and let that dry. And when that dries, I then we'll put it on a piece of substrate. And I could have got that wetter for my example. How long does it take to dry? The veneer tape will dry in five, 10 minutes. So it takes no time at all. Now I'm gluing this to a very thick piece of plywood, quarter inch plywood more or less. So I'll take the, when it's dry, I'll take this blue tape off the back, I'll smear the surface with hide glue, put this on it, again, put the wax paper on top, put a block on top of that, clamp it to my workbench back over in the corner and let it dry. I'll let that dry for an hour. And you end up with something that looks like this. Here's a piece that's glued to the veneer. Uh, and it's got the veneer tape on it. The thickness of this is thicker than you need to have. You can actually use something that's a sixteenth of an inch thick, but I wanted something thick for two reasons. I wanted to make sure this was absolutely flat. One of the first ones I made had a concaveness to it. So I wanted it really th thick to make it really flat. And the other th reason is when you come to put on this banding around the oval in a few minutes, I wanted a really wide surface to take that banding. It made the banding go down easier and gave it a more uh, complete look. It also allowed me to cover up the seam better because I had a bigger glue surface. So again, once you glue that up, it looks like this and it's ready to have the crosses inlaid and the feathers marked. So to take veneer tape off, it's just a reverse. You get it wet. and just peel it off. And if you get it wet and let it sit there a minute or two, this will all come off together. If it doesn't, you can just scrape it off with a scraper. And you end up now with a clean piece that we want to insert crosses and mark the feathers. So I'll give you a short demo on crosses. First of all, this is how small these are. They're really tiny. You can imagine I was trying to cut that on a scroll, a power scroll saw, and 
it didn't work at all. The uh, too many forces and this cross grain on one leg would just rip right off. And even cutting it by hand, uh, I struggled with the same thing. So I ended up deciding I can't cut it even with my hand saw. Then I thought I would chop it out with a chisel. That didn't work either because it cracked off also. So this is how I ended up doing that. I marked the pattern here on this little piece of veneer. And I usually use the bottom of the veneer piece that I've just cut the pattern out of. So the, the depth, the thickness of it is the same. And the size of my cross is a millimeter from the outer edge to the inside edge of each leg. And the bottom piece, I make a millimeter and a half. So it stands a little taller from the bottom. And so here I've marked lines on my piece of veneer and I literally just start taking it out. So I'll take out the big square, which is the full cross in it. And even with this, I have to be a little careful. You have to make a lot of scoring lines. It will shatter on you in a heartbeat. There it is. So that's out. And to get this out, I basically, the technique I've come up with, I'm, there may well be a better way. This is what I do. I just nibble at it. So I'll start picking from the outer edge. So all four corners of this will have to come off to make a cross. So I just nibble up to the line, go back and forth, and basically try to shred the wood in this corner. You probably can't see that, can you? Then I come from the other side. And if you make a group in a row, you can actually make one in a few minutes. But if you haven't been making them, you have to take your time. You can score the line slightly, but I I actually tried to cut this originally by scoring. And what I ran into was even scoring. If you put too much pressure on that score line, when you get to the last piece, it will that cross grain will just give way. So uh, you may well, someone else may well be able to score it with a strong score line and break it out, but I had too many failures. I, when I first started doing these, even with the knife, I tried to do score lines, and I probably had a 30% fail rate. But I got so I could be about 90, 95% effective with this, and it didn't take very long. On each one, I only need, on that one, I just nicked the edge and pulled a little piece across the top. I didn't mean to. Again, if you take your time. Prince of Wales as a motif is a common motif in inlay furniture, particularly stuff from Europe, England. But this particular design is one I made. I could not find a design that I could copy. So I looked at a lot of patterns and looked at what the features of them were. And the features I found were three feather plumes that go up and flip over at the top. I found a crown with a center cross and two side crosses. Ribbons were common, so those were the themes I picked up. And they varied all the time, but I took those themes and just started freehand drawing something I thought I would like and ended up with this design. So it's essentially your signature on the furniture. It is, very true. If I see this pattern again somewhere else, I'll know where it came from, <laughs> which is perfectly fine. I published the pattern in a Sapham magazine as part of an article about this. So there's a cross, so you get the idea. And this doesn't have to be exact. Again, this is a few millimeters across. Most people can see this from four feet away and probably don't even see the crosses. I see it, so I wanted to to be right. And let me describe how I, I lay this in. I'm just going to give you a description of this. I take the cross and I hold it in place and I'll come and I'll score lines across the top, across each of the lines that stick out from the center. I'll score the edge, score the bottom, score this, score, and I'll use this exacto blade to do that. This one has been made months ago. But if you, if, when I was doing these, I would usually glue it up one day and I would put the crosses in the next day. And when you do it the next day, the wood is still wet with glue under the surface. It's set, but it's still damp. And when you do this, it comes out really, really easy. If you wait a few months, it's more of a pick out. So 
you do that and then I come back and I here's where you can score this because it's wet and it will not shred I just deepen those lines and often when you do that I when I was doing this example I got in a rush and knocked that corner off but uh, it'll come out as a complete chunk of wood and, and it's very very fast and that's all it takes and then you put some glue when I, I've done both sides and the, and the middle one you put some glue in the hole put this in press it flat and you've got it put in the clamp on board again so to mark the feathers as I described before I could not successfully do that with a saw blade because it was just too many lines and would fall apart. So I come in here with this blade and I basically just make some deep cuts with my X-Acto coming up from the bottom and coming off of the stem like so. And you can see what it does. It makes these very fine lines that look like feathers. And if we come from the other side, more well, the same. And these lines are in the shaded part and the other side. So when you do that, put a little hide glue on that. I put some in the hole where the cross was. I, before I put the cross in, but just to illustrate the point. I put the cross in, put the glue in, lay the cross on top, and smear this on top. And you can see what it does. Those lines I just put on there really stand out. Because not only are they the dark part of the, of the shaded area, but the hide glue itself sits in the gaps, in, in the little cracks that I've made, lines, and makes it dark. So it looks like feathers. That was what I was after. I made an oval out of plexiglass that I use to mark the size of this oval. And on the plexiglass, I put some tape with some lines to give me some registration points on the pattern. So I've got this bottom piece of tape lines up at the, on the quills and the center piece of tape is kind of the center. Then I just balance the feathers in the middle of all that. Take a pencil and mark an oval. This is where I use my powered scroll saw. I'll go to my powered scroll saw and basically cut that oval out. I'll cut it just outside the line and you'll end up with something like that when you've done so. Maybe this was the one that came out of that where I just cut that out. I then take that to an oscillating sander and sand the edges smooth. So I've got a smooth edge all the way around it. And you'll end up with something that's like this, but without the banding. I haven't put the banding on that yet. It's without the banding. But now we have to put the banding on. Once you're at this point, and even frankly before I cut the oval, I will come by and I will use a block plane. Or I will use a scraper. And get this pretty smooth on the top. And the, and the parts that you're going to be smoothing out is... If the holly veneer is thicker than the black dyed poplar, it'll be a little proud, and you're basically planing this down. The stems will be a little proud, so you need to plane those down. And the scraper is just about the best tool for that. These are very small pieces, and the scraper can very gently take that off. But I've also done, done that using a block plane. I do not use sandpaper for that. I very specifically use a scraper because I want a clean cut, and I do not want to get... I do not want to change the tone and color of this at this point. Scraper is the most effective tool I've found and it keeps it flat and flush. If I use sandpaper, I'll start to round the edges over and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to use this example here, which is already banded, but I'm going to use that to give you an idea of how you put banding on, just because it's already a nice oval shape and easy to do. This is my pen station. So I just take a piece of veneer that I've cut off a larger piece. I measure how much length I need here, and so I can do this and roll this over and know that I need about a little less than seven inches of, of band length. So I've cut this, I think, about seven and a quarter. But I need to bend it around the top and the bottom, and I don't want to break it. So I mark where the top and the bottom should hit with a pencil mark here. I get my hot water from my hide glue bucket, and I put a little water on this on both sides. and just wrap it around the oval, kind of bend the top and bottom. And I'll use the edge of my glue bucket just to put a little pressure, just nice round smooth surface, just to put a little pressure on that point. And that way it won't break when I put it in place. I always put my seam at the top right. I just got in the pattern of doing that. Nothing magical about it. 
But you can see on this one, I talked about the width, the depth of this. I wanted a wide surface to put glue on. The first couple I made, I made them only at about a sixteenth of an inch of a, with a backing on it. And I'd made some other inlays before, fans and things, that, and even the bell flowers on this are only about a sixteenth inch thick, and you just lay those in. But when I tried gluing a banding on a piece that was only a sixteenth inch wide, I had difficulty getting it to sit square and uniform, and the, and the seam and joint was just always ugly. So I, the outgrowth of making this bigger is I got a better glue surface. So as I come around here, and the bottom will come around there, so I can now turn, twist that around without it breaking. I now have to cut the joint. I have a, a single purpose tool. I have this massive chisel, which I use for this purpose only so far. I have not found a second purpose for it. When I first learned to do this, I was taught the way to cut this angle. You cut a low angle. You put this up against a, another piece of wood and stick off the end and you cut the angle off of it. But the piece this wide, I could not cut that consistently. I kept finding out that it would cut off at an angle. So what I ended up doing was coming up with my own method here. So I want this to cut this way and overlap on the other side. I just take my chisel and hold it at about 10 degrees and just make a cut. And I get a nice square cut off the end doing that. And then to do the other side, I make this in a couple of passes. I mark about where I think this is going to be and I'll try to creep up on it. And the cut's actually on the other side. So if that lays this way, that means the cut's got to come this way. So I'm going to cut this a little long first, probably. Again, at the same angle, going the other direction. And it's pretty good for our purposes. So I'll, I'll work that around until I get it really flush. And I'll actually pin it in place dry first to make sure. And then I pin it in place with glue on it. So this is just a block, block of wood. It's a piece of basswood which is soft and easy to penetrate with pins. And I put some clear tape on top of it so I wouldn't have be gluing this to the piece itself. And I use these push pins. And I'll usually use eight or ten pins to go around this. And I'll have to move it a couple of times to get it in the right position. But this last pin, and I usually have two or three up in here, this last pin needs to be right on the joint and really pull that in tight. So I dry fit this like so, just to make sure it works. I'll take these off. I'll use white glue for this because the white glue will dry clear and I don't want that seam to show. Put it back in, put these pins in place with white glue and let it dry. Set it aside an hour or so and let it dry. And when you've done that, you end up with something that looks like this except it'll be standing proud. And this is where I use a block plane. So this will be standing a sixteenth inch up, maybe. Well, not a sixteenth inch up, maybe a thirty-second inch up. And a block plane does a magical job. I just come around this with a block plane, make several passes around really slow, really deliberate. Sometimes I'll use a scraper to do it and bring this down flush. And th at this point, I really make sure the whole surface is flush. And so the final pass I'll make with a scraper just to make all parts flush and uniform. So now I've got a very flat surface that's very smooth on a very sturdy base. Now we have to set it into the leg. So here's my sample leg. So I go to great lengths actually to get this in the right place. I will, I will put tape across the top and bottom and even on the sides to mark the true top, bottom, and, and side dimension. So I'm absolutely square in the middle here. And I'll usually put a piece of tape on here with some lines that mark the dead center horizontally and vertically. So I spend quite a bit of energy getting that absolutely where I want it to be. And I'm, when I'm ready to mark this, I'll put a couple of dabs of high glue on the back of my oval and press it onto my leg. I then take a scalpel, and I use a scalpel rather than an exacto just because it's, it feels thinner and feels easier to handle. And I go around the side and score the edge all the way around. doesn't have to be a deep score, but you need to have it marked everywhere all the way around. When you do that, you take that off and then you, I take my, this is a heavier blade and a heavier handle, the exacto. so I come back and then deepen those all the way around. And this is a slow process. 
And in this particular sample piece of wood, this is a really gnarly grained piece of wood and really hard to cut, harder than the, the legs I made for the table. So I do that. Then I come in and I just sort of back cut under the edge here and take out all the way around chunks of wood right up to the line. Those actually came out pretty easy. And when that comes out, I'll deepen this a little bit, take out a little bit more. I'm just trying to keep a clear space off the edge without damaging the edge. So it's just a lot of picking to get it out. But to take the body of this out, I use a Dremel. So I have a Dremel with a 1 8 inch spiral bit mounted in it, and I have this Stuart McDonald base mounted in it. And because this is so thick, I can't do that in one pass. I'm afraid to do it in one pass. I'm afraid I'll break the blade or tear something up. So I'll set this about half the depth and do half the depth all the way around and take it to the bottom. And the bottom is just set by using that dimension there to set the true bottom of this. You can take this out with chisels and I've, I've done that all the bell flowers I took out. No, actually I use this for the bell flowers too. But you can take it out with chisels and it works just fine. But the, the advantage of the Dremel, you get an absolutely dead flat bottom and you know it's going to be flush and square when you finish. This is a 1 8 inch bit. You can use a 16 inch bit and it'll work just fine, but I wanted to take out more material at one time. So let me take a little bit of this out. And the other thing I'll comment on is you can get up very close to the edge with the Dremel and I'll try to do some of that. So I could get all the way up inside where I've cut here with the Dremel. You get great control with this. So most of this material will come out with a Dremel. And you get the idea. I always move it clockwise. It gives me control. If you, if you go counterclockwise, this Dremel will get away from you and you'll get into the edge. So moving clockwise gives me control at the edge. So I go, I take all that out there, I make it deeper, go all the way to the true bottom. And once, once that's done, I then take chisels and just chip out the edge of this, the, the little edge that's left all the way around. When you've done all that, you'll end up with something that looks like this. So I now have taken out all the edge and, all, and it's a flush on the bottom. And you'll have to tinker with it at the end, just get that final fit, but you want this really fitting tight. And when you get there, put some hide glue in the bottom and tap it home. I'm not going to tap it home because I'll never get it back out. But then you have a completed Prince of Wales inlay. The glue will fill up any of these little gaps around the piece. And for that matter, if I had, even with the bell flowers or an oval, if I had a gap of any size that I did, didn't like, when I'd set something in place with glue, I would take some sawdust of the same wood. I'd rub it in there and just kind of squeeze it in place. Then when it's dry, I come back in a couple hours, come back and scrape it off flush. And the nice thing about high glue is, especially with mahogany, is the color completely blends in and when you scrape that flush, you get a great finish on top. Shellac on top of that, you never know anything was there. So that's how you make a Prince of Wales oval inlay. And I don't recall, I did it one or two ways. I either drew it on the computer, I think I drew it on the computer using a drawing program. So the, the top and bottom are uniform. But I will tell you the way I drew the pattern itself, when I finally got to my 11th design pattern, I digitized that, I scanned it and digitized it. I took it to my computer to a paint program. I cut it in half, took one half and flipped it over so both sides would be completely uniform. The oval I actually drew in a drawing program. I think I drew it in PowerPoint, so the oval was by definition uniform. So that way I had a uniform oval, but my feathers on both sides are identical matches to each other. So after you've put the oval in place and let it dry, you've got to finish it off. So you come back and it's dry, but it'll still be proud a little slightly, but ever so slightly, because I have set the depth of this hole to be exactly, for all practical purposes, the depth of the oval inlay. So you really don't have to do much to it. The, what you're taking off is a thousandth of an inch. If that, you're really taking off the glue that's around the piece. And it only takes a few scrapes with a scraper and you're flush.